sitting in his office. UN Resolution 181 comes onto the scene. It's the surrender of Great Britain and the land of Palestine hands it over to the UN. They say, here, you take care of this problem of the, of the Arabs and the Jews in that area. We're done with it. We can't solve it. We propose a two-nation state. And so 1981 comes by. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 1948 comes by on May 14th. And President Truman's listening to it. He gets up from his desk, or from his, the couch there in the Oval Office, goes over to his desk, he types out a little memo. And he states in there that the United States government recognizes the de facto government of the state of the Jews as the new land of Palestine. Then he crassles out the word Palestine. He writes, handwrites the word Israel in. And that became the fulfillment of a prophecy from 2,500 years earlier. This was the time when Ezekiel would have this vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. And in that vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, he saw, he was looking over across this broad plain, and the bones were scattered, the whole house of Israel. And bone came to bone, and sinew to sinew, and and muscle and flesh formed upon it. And he said, command the winds out of the north, the south, the east, and the west to blow. And he did. And this great army stood up. And the Lord said, this is the house of Israel that would be resurrected in the latter day. And that happened in our day. So 2,500 years ago, from May 14, 1948, a prophecy is fulfilled to the detail. That's amazing. That's amazing. And then... From 536 B.C., the angel comes to Daniel and gives him this prophecy about Israel. Because Daniel's been in captivity because of the prophecy that Jeremiah said 70 years of captivity would come, and indeed it did. They're in the 68th year. Daniel says, well, what's going to happen to Israel now? God not only answers what's going to happen to Israel, but He reaches all the way forward into our day. And with that prophecy... And in, 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 in that prophecy, he says, 70 weeks are decreed, decreed for your people and your holy city. That's interesting. Jerusalem was their holy city. But when Israel became a nation in May 14, 1948, she didn't have control of Jerusalem. That stayed in the control of the UN, which was in the hands of the classically they would call the, the Gentiles. So June 7th, 1967, in the Six Day War, Israel recaptured Jerusalem to be absolutely control of theirs, fulfilling the prophecy of 536 BC. Pretty amazing. And then in 96 AD, John gets a prophecy called the Book of Revelation. He starts to see things that are happening there. And in the Book of Revelation, he calls out the Seventh Beast Empire. It's never, there's eight all together. And during the time, and I was reading some old books, you know, in the 1940s after Israel became a nation, and some of them before Israel became a nation, and it was interesting to listen to those authors talk about the end times when, to, when that, those prophecies hadn't been fulfilled, and they didn't know what to expect out of that. And then after Israel became a nation, to read the prophecies again of these people commenting on those prophecies, they still didn't know what to expect out of that. One place and one place only in the entire Bible, the seventh beast empire is mentioned, is the 17th chapter of Revelation. And it's mentioned in such a benign terms, it's almost you could skip over it and not recognize it. But in order to be an eighth beast empire, which is the empire of Antichrist, there's got to be a seventh. And in 96 A.D., when John got the book of Revelation, he was under the sixth beast empire. Then he mentions the seventh, but it wouldn't come for 1,826 years. That would be when the seventh beast empire would show up. And exactly like the Lord prophesied, it showed up, it remained a little while, and then it was gone. We are now on the precipice of things getting ready to happen for the eighth beast empire, which is the empire of Antichrist. <coughs> 
you look at the trade, the, the, the milepost markers of prophecy that's been fulfilled, it's outstanding. Put that on a mathematical scale, it becomes incomprehensible in the number, the size of those numbers of probability. And yet they all happened. So what's going to happen here? Why, why in 1988, if we followed the rhythm of revivals in America, why did we skip 1988? 1988 should have been a cleansing fire revival, and it wasn't. And 1988 came and gone. And there's some strategy, and there's some interesting things that the Lord is doing in that. No cleansing revivals. And then the Laodicean church comes into play. The Laodicean church era interfaces with the Philadelphian church era. And in the Laodicean church era, it would be an anything goes apostate style type Christianity. Where you would, it's not about the love of God, let's call the love of God tolerance. Because Ephesians says to speak the truth in love. So in order for there to define love, you have to have truth. You can't just have love without truth, because then anything goes. You can make love stand for anything then. And yet in 1988, we softened down the truth, and we enlarged the premises of love, and then all kinds of things came in, and this new thing emerged out of it called tolerance. In other words, and now if you're not tolerant of various things that God finds an abomination, then you are a bigot. And so the church softened on this thing called truth, enlarged into a false dimension of God's true definition of love, adopted a form of tolerance, and then we come up with today what we call the seeker-friendly churches. But there's strategy in that. One of the things that Paul did when he went and preached the gospel is that he always went to the synagogues, and there he would find Jewish convert, or excuse me, Gentile converts to Judaism and the Jews. And then he would preach Christ largely to that crowd, extracting the Gentiles out of that, and actually being quite of a disruptor kind of guy when he preached the revelation, the revelation that he heard directly from Jesus that they didn't get, because they didn't have eyes to see, hearts to understand, and ears to hear. So they stood up against him for the lack of that revelation of the truth that he was actually preaching. So what is the Lord going to do now? Well, you've got mega churches all over America. Large, large churches all over America. What a great opportunity. All the fish are in one bucket. You know, now you've got a, now, now you've got a collecting and a gathering, and it doesn't make any difference what their agendas are. It makes no difference. It's a strategy by God. Because now, at least, they're going to be in that format. And then the visitations of the Holy Spirit are going to come. And when He does... People are going to not, this thing called tolerance is going to be exploded into micron material, what's left of it. And there's going to be a cry for the hunger and the holiness of God as He does something that no man can do. And then you'll see those seeker friendly churches, you'll see those churches that have adopted this thing called tolerance in judging the rest of the body of Christ as bigoted. You'll see this one thing that the Lord does is He starts to stitch everything together into one format. Now, there's a lot of things of information that you can know in Scripture. A lot of things. And I'm a, just got prompted on something here, so I don't want to forget that. But next Sunday is, um, you know, Phil and Tasha's going away. So you want to be here next Sunday and bring something delightful to eat. Lobster, steak will be fine. <laughs> That we want to send them out fat, okay? So that'll be next Sunday, by the way. <laughs> Just a side road on that. I have a message here titled, No Time for the Right Time and a Cry for Revival. And if you're looking at, the, looking at the, what we have in America today, you cannot help but talk about, to a certain degree, in the faith of Christ, Christianity, you can't help but refer to issues of politics. In fact, the whole Bible is about politics. It's about people's politics interfacing with God's righteousness. And so you, people say, well, you need to separate those two out. Well, try doing that. God wrote a book called Kings, and that's all about politics. 
It's about one king going up and another king coming down and the politics intermingling of policies and different things that stood against God. But there is a balance to it. And certainly as we're seeing a slide in America move more and more to this hyper-liberal state. And when we say hyper-liberal, it's a departure from the conservative standards of Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, that America was founded upon. Now, I'm for one, I believe that the Constitution of the United States of America was an inspired document. And I believe that it was an inspired document to give some sense of stability to a nation that God would use to cover Israel, that God would use to seed in the modern world the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God would use America. And there's prophecies over America that George Washington himself received and visitations of angels that George Washington received and wrote those things down. So America is a country, this is interesting to note, God chose one nation on the planet as his own, that was Israel. But there's only been one nation on the planet that chose God from its beginning, and that's been America. No other nation except America has chosen God from its beginning. And I'm not talking about God in, in, as a generic. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, Jehovah God Almighty. That's what America was founded upon. So we are now in a time where we're seeing a lot of things happen. We're seeing elections that were stolen. We're seeing things that are happening on the international front. We're talking about departing from Israel. You could go on with that bullet list, down the list, over and over and over, all the way down. And you could say, this is not what we believe in. This is not our tradition. This is not the country that was founded on those principles. Those principles are not what represent us. President Obama went to the world and said, we're no longer a Christian nation. That was his view of America. That's not what America is from God's view. We're the nation that set more bread upon the water than any nation has done more for the gospel than any nation since the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what are we as a, a Christian now, what should we do? You think you're born as an accident in this time of humanity? Do you think that your time coming from beginning before the time was, the world was, when God says, I knew you, and wrote the book for you, Psalm 139, 16, 17, down there. He says, when that book was written for you, when as yet there was not one of them. He's supernatural. He doesn't, time is subject to him. He stands outside of time. That's why he calls himself the great I am. How can he say, I was, and now I am? <laughs> he doesn't say that. He says, I am, because he stands outside of time. He is constant. He has no beginning. He has no end. So he can only be, I am. And when you think about it from the standpoint of how what enters into the omniscience of God's mind was you were there. You were in that. And God chose you to be born at such a time as this. The question that you have to do, as we talked about on Thursday, in the ultimate sense is to seek Him so that you can understand that sense and that place of purpose and calling upon your life because you are here at this time. You are here at this time for what reason? Now, you're not an accident. You're not statistical. Well, this is how humanity develops. That's not that at all. You're here because God has chosen you to be at such a time as this, just like God chose people to exist in the day of Christ, like God chose people to exist in the day of Moses, like God chose people to exist in the day of Abraham. You're chosen for this time now. So Judges says this, the angel of the Lord, this is about this guy by the name of Gideon. I want you to see something, the parallels in this. An angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now Gideon didn't see himself that way. He's standing in a wine press and he is taking the wheat and he is lifting the wheat and blowing the chaff away into the wind. And the reason why wheat is in a wine press is because the Midianites... And the Amalekites were constantly raiding the ground and stealing their crops. So now they had to hide it. Then Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Hello, America. Why is all this stuff happening to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? America, where are they? Did not the Lord bring us up 
from Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given to us the land, the hand of Midian. Now, if the Midian and the Malachites, you should probably know a little bit about, they are a nations of people, two nations, and they came from uh, Lot, excuse me, Job, excuse me, Lot, came from Lot who was in Sodom and Gomorrah. When Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah, his two daughters went with him, and they said, there's nobody here now to raise up children for us. So they got their father drunk, had sex with him, and created two sons. Midian and the Malachites came out of that. So they're an ancestral race. Their genetic code would find Lot in that group. But, and they were related in a certain sense to Abraham because Lot is the nephew of Abraham. But Abraham is the chosen one of God by which he would build the nation of Israel, not Lot. So now they are rivals against Israel. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. This guy was a hard one to convince. Hello? America. You are so religiously hard religiously saturated, religiously numb, that it's difficult to find the very pulse and heartbeat of a heart-to-heart -heart connection with the Father. We are so filled with head knowledge that we have forgot the relationship aspect of the Lord. Please do not depart from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I'll wait. I'll remain until you return. Now he's going to go out and he's going to you know, slaughter something, you know, and he's going to make it, and he makes make some bread. So it's not like this angel's standing around going, dum, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> you know, he's waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. It was not something quick. So he tells him, the Lord looked at him and said, go in the strength of yours, Deliver Israel from the hand of Midian, for I have, not, for have I not sent you? He said, well, Lord, how will I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. Now what happened when he went and got his offering, there's three things that Gideon will do all the time. Because he's, you know, if you think doubting Thomas had a problem, you've got to go to Gideon. So Gideon said, well, if it's you, i got to find out if it's you, if it's really you, you know, really, really you, then wait here, I'll come back with my offering. He comes back with that offering, and he pours it out, and the Lord says to him, pour it out on a stone. And so he pours out the stone, and the broth, and the, and the bread, and he sets it all up there, and the Lord takes the staff and touches the stone, and this fire comes up and consumes, and, got, and Gideon says, okay, you're the guy. You're the guy. <laughs> now what do I do? And he says, go in the strength and deliver Israel. Now, here is something that has no plan. This is a calling. It has no plan to it. He, he is now raising up the man to give himself the sense and definition of a calling so that he has the courage to act. When I look at the body of Christ today, I find a lot of Christians, believers in Christ, who have no identity as to a calling and to a purpose. You don't know what you are. And so you're doing everything but pursuit of the Lord because you don't know who you are. You don't know what your calling is. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're doing. You read the Bible, but for what? You come to church, but for what? What is your purpose? What are you in Christ? You don't even know. Most Christians, I can say that to, don't even know what their purpose and calling in Christ is. They know where they're going to heaven. They know their name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. But aside from that, what do you know besides that? That's, not, that's going to change real soon. I believe that. He tells them the very end of it. You will, uh, surely I'll be with you and you'll defeat Midian as one man. Now you're going to see how large this army is. So Gideon is renamed Jerubbaal, Jerub, uh, Jerubbaal, and what happened was that he gets this direction from the Lord to go tear down the, the altar of Baal in the Ashtoreth, which was the despicable, despicable idol worship of the day in which his people were in. Now if you go back, you look at this and you say, to this, you say why is Israel in a mess? Listen carefully. When you lose vision and you lose purpose and identity in Jesus Christ, you will dilute and scatter into everything else and then good ideas will be on the plate for you. You'll follow the agenda of good ideas because you don't have a definition of an assignment from Christ. 
You have this generic, yes, you're saved. Yes, you love people. Yes, you want to do good. Yes, you believe God can do miracles. Yes, but you're not seeing any. You get, once in a while, you get touches and nudges from God. That God is doing something. You get a reminder that God is real. But you have no consistent flow. You have nothing consistent that convinces you this is the direction, this is where we're tracking. You don't have that. Consequently, the problem becomes for you is that you will start looking at the list and you'll start filling down, well, let's go do this and then let's go do that and let's go have the, And everything will be to occupy time and nothing will be to go to a focal point because you don't know what the focal point is. And so now you're just occupying time. Now you're just filling space. And now you're just coming up with good ideas. God doesn't want your life led like that. He wants your life led by a focal point. By what you're called, by what you are, your, your purpose, your calling, your identity, your significance in Christ. So Jeroboam, he gets named, this great name, the one who contends and took down the altar of Baal, two oxes, one pulls it down, both of them pull it down, and he offers one to God. And all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod, and the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah on the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give to Midian into their hands, for Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now, from that space and time where he pulls down this, this, the Ashtoreth and Baal, and Baal, of course, as you know, they would, was the molten image. Moloch was part of Baal worship, as long as the Ashtoreth, which was a sexual perversion cult that happened. When he, tear, when he tears that down, he calls the people, the Abizarites, in. Now, the Abizarites are part of his family name. He calls them in. He says, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Th there are people without identification. If you look across the board in America right now at the Christians, they're no different than they are in Cheyenne. There's very, very few pockets and holdings of Christians that have a direction where they're forcing into something. Most of them are just attenders. Most of them are just, they, they have this smear of generality across their life, but they don't have a specific. Most of America is that way right now. And that's the way the Jews were. They had left the Lord. They were in, involved in all kinds of idol worship. They had been given over to their enemies. There was this identity of, of, of the Abrahamic identity in them. Stop and think about your life in Christ. You read the word, but for what? Do you comprehend the word or you just read it? Is it an academic issue to you? Do you understand the prophecies that are laden in there? Do you really believe that the Bible is the living word of God? That everything that God says comes out of his mouth is, is life? His words are life? They don't die. This is not a history lesson that, you know, somebody said. It's words that were penned by the inspiration of the Spirit as God spoke through people. Put those things down as if God guided the pen and said, these are my words and they'll never die. So we read it, but for what? So the question is, where are you going with your Christianity? What are you doing with it? What's it for? And moreover, in this generation, why are you here with all that? Gideon has this problem, but God has now given him a focal point. And now he's going to muster the people together. And 32,000 people show up. It's not much against what he's going to see here. And then the Lord starts to qualify. Now listen very, very, very carefully what I'm going to say to you. You're born for a reason. You're born at this time right now. You exist in Christ now for a purpose. And the Lord is about ready to come upon the land, I would say in America, but not just America, in various parts of the world as well. If you're going down the street, you're just walking, three out of four people that you pass on the street are not on the registry of the Lamb's Book of Life. They are destined for an eternal damnation separated from God forever. 
three out of four that you pass on the street. That means that you're a minority. And of that final 25%, that's a mingling between those that are serving God and those that are just there. So you reduce that number down even again as to the fervency and the purpose of Christ. And it's because a lot of them don't have anything to put their hand to. They don't know what to do with this thing called Jesus. They don't know what to do with this thing of their faith. They don't know what to do. I've got it. What do I do with it? It's like, you know, giving a tool to somebody that never doesn't know how to use it. Pretty nice and shiny, but what do you use it for? One of it is to serve the Lord, and serve the Lord in His purpose. So the Lord said to Gideon, The people are with you, are too many for me to give, to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now therefore, come, proclaim the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 people remained. Now, you're Gideon, and you're going to face off against a mighty army, and 22,000, one-third of your people leave. Two-thirds of your people leave. you got 10,000 left. See, listen to this very carefully. Fear, the existence of fear, is, creates a state of that those who fear are not dependable. You don't know how people react in fear. L Hello, look at the COVID. Look at the way the COVID raced through the body of Christ and then look at the reaction to the fact of COVID. It created fear. Look at the fear that, that covered the land. Look at the fear. And then look at God's word, which is fact. Which one are you standing on? You can't stand on both at the same time. You can't embrace fear in the left hand and faith in the right hand. And if God's word is absolutely true, then you have to react according to one or the other. Now, I'm sorry that we cut it that absolute, but that's the way it is. If God says that by his stripes that you were healed then what will you fear? If the Lord says that the plague, 10,000 to your left and 1,000 to your right, but it shall not, shall not come against you, what are you going to fear? If every wep any weapon that is formed against you, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, it's formed against you, but it will not prosper and have its way, then what do you fear? So you, you see, we have all these nice little cute little phrases of Scripture that we go, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And then when it comes, we're going, oh my God, it's coming, it's coming. You know, and we're going, wait, we can't talk out of both sides of our mouth. Let's just be real here and strip it off. Either you are a Christian operating in the force of fear, or you are a Christian operating in the force of faith. One of the two. But you can't play between both of them. Things will happen. Epaphroditus was Paul's traveling companion. And Paul left him. Had God not done anything for him, Epaphroditus was going to die. But God raised Epaphroditus up. Paul, it was said, that had problems with his eyes. We don't know what the outcome was. Moses was a man who stuttered. And that's why he sent him Abraham. Excuse me, Aaron. I believe that God later on healed Moses. It doesn't say that in the scripture, but I believe that he did because you don't find Aaron speaking for Moses most of the time after that. God does have solutions. You've got an undependable group of people here. You've got a large number, but most of them are fear-based. You can't use them. And the reason why they're fear-based is because you don't know where they've been. If they've been with Christ then that fear gets displaced. If they're having fellowship with Christ, that fear is displaced. If they're reading the Word, that fear is displaced. If they've been with Christ in fellowship, reading the Word, and worshiping God, fear is displaced. If they're not doing that, then fear will find its way up. 
Because you're going to make volume for one where the other can't be. But you're going to get one or the other. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I'll test them there for you. <coughs> Therefore it shall be that he of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now here's what happened. This was, this was actually something by habit that God was going to expose. So they kneeled down, and here was the division line. This is how the Lord judged the criteria. They kneeled down, and as he kneels down, this was the, word, the posture for the worship of Baal. And they would put their face to the ground, kind of like you would see the Muslims in their praise with the forehead to the ground. That was the way the worship of Baal was. And they went down and they lapped water like a dog because they're so used to getting down in that posture that was habitual to go down where the others took water, scooped it up and brought it to their mouth and drank. And so the difference was that there was 9,700 separated. So the 10,000 that remained, watch this, they were not fearful but they were brazen and they were bold. And they weren't necessarily connected to Christ. In that sense of the element of faith. He ended up, and this is where America's at today, with 300 compared to 32,000. It's going to be very, very few that come into this next move of God that God will use because they are so sold out over to the plan of Jesus that they're living a sacrificial life according to his plan and the good ideas are off the list. The flittering moment is gone. They're, they're, they are consistent. They're straight line. They know what God's doing. I'll deliver you with the 300 men who lap and give you, and then I will give the Midianites to you with those 300 men. This is interesting. The same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go against the camp, for I've given it to you in your hands. But if you are afraid to go down, go with Pura, your servant, down to the camp. And you will hear what they say, and afterwards your hands will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. So he went down with Pura, his servant, down to the outpost of the army that was in his camp. And this guy has this dream. One of the enemies has a dream. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. This is how big they were, their numbers. And their camels were throughout number as numerous as the sand of the sea. They crossed this hill... One man and his friend Pura left behind 298 people and they come over this hill and they see this, it looks like a metropolitan without houses of people. And when Gideon came, behold, a man was relating, Gideon sneaks into the camp, a man's relating a dream to his friend. He goes, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of the Midian, of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned upside down so that the tent lay flat. His friend replied, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. Isn't that interesting that God can take a man who's not even in the faith, and use him to interpret the dream of prophecy. It's amazing. So they go back, and they, here's what they had, literally. So he stations the camp at midnight, divides his company up in 100s, and they get around in a, in a triangular quadrant to this camp. And they've got these clay pots over their torches. So the torches are burning into the clay pots, and then they've got trumpets in the right hand, 300 trumpets. Trumpet in the right hand, the clay pot in the left, and then they turn around and they get in their station, and at midnight the call goes out, and then they break the pots, and suddenly there's this burst of light all around them, and then they blow the trumpets. So the army's asleep, they get wakened up by what they see, 300 torches, representing who knows how many around them. And they hear this blast of the trumpet and they rise up and God sends them all against each other and they slay one another. And those that are not slain, they take off until finally they're overtaken. And then God gives Midian into their hand. 
So he gave them a strategy of what to do. And the Lord used deception and confusion of the enemy and turned it against them. Now listen to what I'm saying to you. We're about ready to step into something here. And I want, to, I want Jane at this time to come up and share something that the Lord spoke to her as a rhema. So, amen. Amen. <clears throat> and, she's, and she's doing good, too. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for praying. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read Psalm 2 real quick, just the first six verses. Um, did, Psalm. My arm's around her because she's my wife, not because I'm a cozy pastor. just wanted to make you. Okay. <laughs> Stay <All> right. Right. <laughs> okay. Psalm 2 says, how, this is yesterday morning. How dare the nations plan a rebellion? Their foolish plots are futile. Look at how the power brokers of the world rise up to hold their summit. As the rulers scheme and confer together against Yahweh and his anointed king, saying, Let's come together and break away from the Creator. Once and for all, let's cast off these controlling chains of God and His Christ. God enthroned merely laughs at them. The Sovereign One mocks their madness. Then with the fierceness of His fiery anger, He settles the issue and terrifies them to death. With these words, I myself have poured out my King on Zion, my holy mountain. Well, yesterday morning, I just kept reading and reading this psalm, and I couldn't get away from it. I tried to get away from it, and I just kept reading and reading. And then when I stopped for a moment, the Lord said to me, prepare yourself to meet with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was a word for all of us. Yeah. Prepare yourself to meet with the Lord. Amen. 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 Yeah. Thank you. So, um, Michelle uh, printed up uh, this prayer out of the Ephesians, and, John, and, and then Ron had something. These were independent, by the way. Ron had something for fasting, uh, written by Derek Prince. Interestingly enough, the songs this morning, without conference per se, were songs that reflect everything about this message, the prayer of Ephesians, and what God is, and the, and the fasting. So I'm telling you something in the Spirit of the Lord that God is about ready to show up. But I, we're giving a, a window here of something to do that you've never done before. Do you remember sometime back the word that God gave me? Do you remember that? what that word was? Anybody remember it? He's going to give you something you've never had. He's going to require of you something he's never given. Yes. To take you places you've never been. Right. He's taking us to a place we've never been to give us something we've never had and requiring something we've never given. Now, those three things came to me early in the morning. I want to tell you that I, the Lord woke me up. I don't think that the Lord woke me up, but I was awake when He spoke to me. Early, early in the morning, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So, we have a choice here. And um, this cannot come by a religious formula. It cannot come by cookbook Christianity. We've all tried that. It doesn't work, by the way. We can't do the 21-day fast. Aren't you glad that Daniel didn't wait 100 days? <laughs> Praise God. Or there'd be a 100-day fast formula. You know... So, the formulas don't work, but the seeking does. And the seeking is going to require something of you. Because as I've said, as, as you have, as Christians, if you don't have the standing of your purpose and calling, if you don't know what that is, then you'll get bored with your faith. And the liveliness of the Spirit in that sense of your faith is very stifled or subtle. And so in the manner of that speaking, then what takes place is you start filling in your own blank. You start calling your own agenda. You start doing what you want to do. You start setting up your own plans. And then you miss the plan of God. Let me tell you something. The plan of God and the location of God go hand in hand. Yesterday when I was on my prayer walk... Um, I found myself praying 
that God would bring a Brownsville revival to Cheyenne? Why not? Why not? It walked along itself with this dream that I had of Cheyenne. And you talk about the strategic location of Cheyenne, that it is intersected by two major interstates, I-25 and I-80, the north and the south, the east and the west. And the equidistance that it has to major metropolitan areas. Now we have voices in America, prophets in America that are situated, and God has given them an, a face before the cameras of the world with a voice to be proclamated. But then something happens in a place like Cheyenne, a major trunkway that goes east and west and north and south. And a Brownsville revival can start here that will be so contagious that it will be like embers to the wind that don't go out but that land all across the west as fires begin to start. As those that come in get touched by the fires of God and then those go out. There may be many Cheyennes in America where this is going to take place. But I know that we're destined for that here in Cheyenne. That the Brownsville thing is about ready to happen in here. And I don't say Brownsville, which was, um, for me, um, it, was a, it was a season of something, an awakening type of deal. But it wasn't the final of what God is getting ready to do. We are, this thing that's about ready to happen is going to usher us into the final. And this which is about ready to happen is going to come with signs and wonders and miracles. It will make the Brownsville revival considerably less profile than what God is getting ready to do. And there's a reason why. As I started out this message this morning, three out of four people that you presently walk past on the streets are not saved. You know what? And the church is failing. We are failing. Because we have been religious, but we haven't been in relationship. The church is dry. It's dead. There's no life in it. Let's be honest. I'm not speaking about you and your faith in Christ, but I'm talking about Christendom in America. There, you, there's nothing to appeal to people who don't believe in Christ. You know, what are we going to say? Believe in Jesus. Etherically what? For what? Why do I want to believe in Jesus? For what reason? Oh, so you'll be saved. Well, you don't look too much different than me right now. You know, where's your joy and your peace and your happiness? I mean, that's just being straight up and honest. What do we have to tell a world that's not saved why they need to be saved? Yes, we need to speak the truth. That's true. We have the truth. That's true. But the reason why America is in the state that she is is because, first place, the church failed, not America. Amen. The church failed first. And when the church failed first, then America followed. And more specifically, the Christians quit seeking Christ. And they got busy with things. And they got involved in different things. That is about to change as deep calls unto deep. And we start to stand up to our feet and we say, no more. There is a God in heaven and he is real and his word is real. And the riches of the kingdom of God are, are there for us if we will muster together and seek the face of the Lord. And turn to him and forsake our ways and watch what God will do with us. He's looking for a people that will do that. Amen. Amen. Psalm 51 was a prayer that I believe is the prayer for us today. Along with what, Michelle, you had in Ephesians and added Colossians to this. That the eyes of our understanding would be open. Along with the seeking of the Lord, Ron, like what you had in the leaflet back there that you put on. on. These, these nudges in the spirit have a design to them. Ron, you didn't just come up with that because it was a nice thing, and neither did you, Michelle, and neither did you, Jane. But God is afoot in getting ready to do something, and I'm telling you, if you have a heart to hear and to understand, recognize this. So David says, after his sin with Bathsheba, where he murdered Uriah the Hittite, and Bathsheba was the Hittite, by the way, and so Solomon was half Jew and half Hittite. He was half Gentile and he was half Jew. The Hittites, Uriah the Hittite was a faithful man to David. 
when David had him murdered to cover up his sin, there were other men that were killed along with Uriah in the process of getting that thing to take place in the battle. So it wasn't just one man that was killed. There were several men that were killed in the battle to get Uriah up there to the front that had to draw back before he was killed in battle. So it made it look natural. But it was a plan of murder. He gets found out. Nathan, the prophet, comes to him and speaks to David. And then David writes this psalm. And this psalm is for you and I. Maybe we didn't murder somebody, but maybe we have departed so far from Christ. Bored with your faith and bored with your Christianity and incidental and really not involved. As I said, many Christians pray, but 99% of the Christians don't have a prayer life. Many Christians read the Word, but 99% of them don't study God's Word systematically and regularly. Many Christians acknowledge Christ, but very few actually seek Him on a continuous basis. You'll have pockets of prayer, moments of prayer, surges of prayer, surges when you read. But I'm talking about where there's a consistency in what we're talking about. So he says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. That's the first thing we start with, is God's mercy for our life. Some of you are caught up right now. I'm just pinching the spirit right now. Some of you are caught up with doing things in the industry of things and you're so far out of God's will and you can't even recognize it because it's not necessarily a thing that's wrong. But it doesn't fit with you right now. You are out of God's will in some things. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Merciful, holy God, I come to you. I don't kind of have anything to offer you, but I come to you as I am, exactly as I am. And I come to you in the power through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where my mercy, my compassion, the grace is, He's already given to me. That, that transgression that Jesus paid for. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, the word is sin, not sins. It means this thing, this entity, this domain that you are in that is non responsive to God. You got your own agenda going, you got your own plan going, you got your own thing happening. And in the back of that, you got all the fuzzies. Oh, Jesus is good and I love him. Yeah, probably true. But are you in the perfect will of what God has for your life? For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. A sin conscious people. But he's going before the Lord says there's only one answer to this. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. There are things that are operating in our lives right now at this moment in your life right now that are not the will of God and there is a consequence to them. And the hardest thing to recognize is when you're doing something good that's not got the brand of evil and it's not God's will and you're doing it and it's going to have a consequence to it. And the enemy is going to exploit it. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity in sin my mother conceived me because... She was born with the genetic code of Adam like we all were. We were all conceived in the state of not the act of sin, but in the state of sin. Nobody was conceived sinless except for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. And he was conceived by the Holy Spirit born through the Virgin Mary. All of us were, came from parents who were sinners. And when we were born, we were born with the same nature that our parents had. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. When that principle, when we talked about the principle and the precept, and the precepts of truth and the principle is the thing that walks you out carrying that precept forward. God wants principle inside of his people. He wants these boundaries set. He wants a consciousness of Christ that is so accurate, so clear, and so clean that we are willing to live a sacrificial life 
to do His will rather than being bored with our Christianity and filling out our own desire sheet and then go do that. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Clean, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. This hyssop is a part of the plant family, of the mint plant family. And it is an antioxidant. It was interesting when I was doing this this morning, Jane walks into my office and she says, here's some mint tea for you. <laughs> that was interesting. It was right when I was doing the study on the hyssop. Here's some mint tea for you. I think it had more meaning than just meant tea. But what would happen is that David, this verse 7 right here, had to do with David saying, look, if you will forgive me, and, and he's using language is what you cleanse the leper with. And so when the leper would come to the priest, having already been cleansed from his leprosy, he would go through the final ceremony, like Jesus said to the lepers, go and present yourself to the priest. And they would take two clean birds probably doves. And they would take those birds, and then one they would kill, and there would be the, the, the blood of the one bird dipped in, and it was cedar, and then this hyssop would dip in that solution, and they would sprinkle the person with the hyssop, with the other bird, using the other bird as well. Kind of an abstract thing, but God had purpose and reason for it. So he is saying, look, if you will purify me, if you will cleanse me, then I will be restored back to my state as a king before the people. Because verse 7 here had to do with after they were cleansed in the ceremony of the public endorsement. That's what he was saying. Now I need to be endorsed for my sin has been made known and I need to come back out into public fully endorsed. Listen to me, body of Christ. We're all people in here who are messing up at different times and different places whether it's thought life or words or living a selfish life or living a life that you and I fill out our own agenda. We're going to do our own thing. I don't hear from God. I don't know what God's doing. So guess what I'm going to do? And then we just start listening and putting out our list. And God's not in it. It's not evil per se, but it's not where God has you. And you're going to go do that. And you're going to get caught up in it. And it's going to create famine in your spirit. There's going to be a price to pay for not seeking the Lord and staying in the very, press, very power place of His will. And then God is going to take this body of Christ, you people, make us together here, with all that we have, and when we seek the face of God, and we call upon His name, and we genuinely do that, and we set aside all of our selfish life and reasons and activities and things like that, and we set aside the selfish things that we do because we're bored with our faith, and we go, okay, it's time to break up the fallow ground and to seek the Lord. Time to break it up. So here's what I saw. I saw a granite slab out in front of our church. Five feet thick, ten feet square. And everybody was given a sledgehammer. And the Lord said, break it up. And some people looked at their sledgehammer, and they looked at this granite slab, and they said, I don't see any purpose for this. And others went over there and they hit it several times and nothing happened. It just, the, sl the sledgehammer just bounced off of it. They said, this is useless. This isn't going to work. And there were others up there and they were hitting as hard and as fast until sweat was pouring out of them. They said, it'll work if we don't quit. And they kept hitting and kept hitting and kept hitting. Others stood around going, I just don't see it. And others stood around going, I don't see it at all. And others were involved in it. And when I said break up the fallow ground, that is that ground that's just hard caked. It hadn't been watered. It hasn't been broken up. It hadn't been prepared. And God says, I'm calling you in. I'm calling you. When you start on this thing and you continue, then you'll find me. 
He says, make me to hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. That's what would happen to the shepherd when the sheep was constantly wandering off. The shepherd would go and get the sheep and break the leg of the sheep. And then that sheep would not be so self-willed and, so, and just doing what it's always wanted to do and just wandering off constantly, constantly for greener pastures and a new place and this place over here while the flock was over here and it consumed the shepherd always having to leave the flock to go rescue the one and bring him back. And finally after a while then the shepherd breaks the leg of the sheep and then mends it and then that sheep does not wander away from the flock. So David talks about this. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Then he says in verse, in verse 10, this is the seeking part. Listen to me carefully. This is what only God can do. But if you'll present yourself before the Lord, he'll do this. But maybe you're too busy and you've got some other things you've got to do. Maybe you're too caught up in some daily routines. And I understand, you know, just leave the sledgehammer there. Somebody else will pick it up for you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God. So we're all trashed out. We're, we're toxified with this world. At the same time, we're reaching and we're reading and we're not changing. And there's nothing happening and God is not showing up and nothing's really taking place. After all, why should we seek the Lord in times like this when God is quiet, the heavens are sealed, the earth is barren? Why seek God now? Because the earth is barren and the heavens are sealed. That's why we should seek God now. That's why we should set aside our own agenda. That's why we should stop our own lifestyle that is what it is, individually as it may be, where we're caught up in unimportant tasks. I spent four hours underneath my trailer yesterday wiring lights. The earth didn't tremble. The heaven didn't shake. The vanguard of angels didn't meet me. And for four hours, I laid there wiring lights up and getting these things done and finding out where the short was at. And at the end of the day, I thought to myself, what have I accomplished? Not a lot. Maybe I prevented a rear-end collision. I don't know. I have tail lights in the, day, in the nighttime or something. I don't know. But I had to weigh that against the things that God was putting into my heart and ask myself, what does it take? When I was reading the book on revivals across America, do you know there's a place in the early 1800s that Christianity had ebbed down itself so low in profile that Voltaire said, Voltaire said, the, the great uh, atheist, he said, in 30 years Christianity won't even exist. John Marshall, who was the chief justice of the Supreme Court, he goes, I don't know that Christianity can survive in America anymore. Right after, the, right after the Civil War, America had hit such a drastic low that for the first time women were afraid to walk the streets at night or leave their homes. America had come to itself down that low until a revival came. And then it surged up. And the politicians found themselves completely falling to the will of the people and themselves getting caught up in the vortex of the Spirit of God. Up in the Rogues River, they had to actually cut down trees and make stumps out of them for, to, as a pulpit so they could preach. And there were five camps at the same time going on because the crowds had showed up in the thousands without radios or TVs or newspapers or trains. They showed up on buckboard and on horse and on foot into this one place where they began to seek God and ask for a revival. And God wouldn't answer our prayer in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I believe with all my heart that, the, that this church among the believers, and I'm not highlighting it in any elite sense, but we're a weird church compared to a lot of churches in Cheyenne. Amen. <laughs> we are a weird church. And I have said to God, I said, where are the kids at, God? I've never pastored a church where I didn't have a massive Sunday school department. Where are, where are the kids at? There are none. 
But the Lord did tell to me, say to me that he was bringing in the eagles. And that, I believe, bringing in is what's here added to us. Eagles. It was interesting, out of the blue, Shirley called me a couple of days ago. And she says, Don, you've been on my heart. She goes, I just want to pray for you, and then I'm going to hang up. I said, okay. <laughs> I'm all ears. First thing she said, God's going to bring the eagles into the church. She's got us bringing eagles into the church. Those eagles are the ones that fly above the storm. They're the ones that have this tenacity, this ability in the spirit. They see things from a different lofty point of view. They're not like the crows down there in the ground pecking at the carcasses of the trash and the ravens that were considered unclean birds. Reggie Bank calls me. I haven't heard Reg from Reggie in a long time, but one time I was in Chicago and I was speaking. I completely forgot about this. And I was at a meeting of, of I don't know, 20 or 30 pastors in there. And I started preaching, speaking to these pastors. And the Spirit of God came into the room and all the pastors came out of their chairs without any solicitation, came out of their chairs on their knees and they were crying and weeping. And I, they were not paying attention to me, so I stopped preaching. I walked out, and Reggie comes out the door to me, and she gets within four inches of my face. Reggie, I think the Aunt Jemima syrup bottle was designed after her. She was this black woman and prophetess, shaped like the Aunt Jemima syrup bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and she got into my face, and I could feel the heat of her breath as she spoke. And she said to me, she sang to me. I didn't even know who this person was. Can you imagine a stranger walking up, grabbing your arms, getting their face way past your body, you know, in, in that, you know, personal zone. And you can feel the breath, the heat, the humidity from their breath in your face. And she starts singing that the Lord is your shield, your exceedingly great reward, which is exactly the scripture that God had been speaking to me three weeks before that. She started singing it. So she calls me up again. This is 20 years later, 15 years later. And she sings that exact same thing to me again and says what God is getting ready to do. And I believe that God is ready. And then today, everything about this service today, every single thing about it has to do with all the things Ron coming up with the, hey, I just printed this thing up about fasting. It's back there at the table. And then Michelle comes up and gives me this thing on Ephesians and adding to that Colossians. And then the message and then the songs and then the things and then Jane's word last night. God is saying something, people. Don't cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Well, he was talking about a time at that moment where the, where the Holy Spirit... Uh, was upon the, but was not. Remember, David wasn't cleansed by the blood of Jesus at this time. So he didn't have that blood that would legally cleanse him so that the Spirit of God could stay. But he was saying, Look, please don't do this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your well. When, when this revival hits, you won't have to tell people, do you know Jesus? They will come in hungering and thirsting for Christ. He will be the one that draws them in. Right now, we academically come up to people. Well, have you given your life to Jesus? And there's not a whole lot there in the sense of the anointing or the drawing of the Spirit. And then we go, well, they're just going to go to hell then. That's not the way the heart of the Lord is. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. That's one of the things that you're going to see in this move of God. Is pro pro prolific worship is going to be taking place. I will say this to you. Listen to me carefully. It's not going to be the preaching of men in pulpits in this next move of God as it's going to be the chorus of the worship of the saints and the, and the descendants of the Holy Spirit upon us in a blanket where one will just walk up to someone and just pray for them and they'll be healed. There won't be a call for healing per se. There won't be a call for salvation per se. 
There'll be, there'll be opportunities and services for water baptisms, but there's going to be the blanket of the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to fall upon the body, and all of us in Christ will be used by the power of the Holy Spirit for the signs and the wonders and the miracles in spontaneous fashion in the atmosphere of worship. Yes. In the atmosphere of praise and worship. O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. From the doldrum place that we stand, running in oil in Arctic temperatures, and trying to wade through that type of atmosphere, it's going to get pretty free and powerful in the days to come. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it to you. You're not pleased with burnt offerings. Here's what God's looking for. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Lord, visit us again in America. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifice and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then your young bulls will be offered on your altar. In other words, from that point forward, God says, then I will receive you. Listen to me carefully. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to begin on this. I have no idea except a call for prayer. Except a call for prayer in Mass. The Tabernacle of David is, is fit for such a thing as this. It's a call, but if, but if we will have this place set up for prayer. Now we've got meeting nights and things like that are going on and we've got two churches sharing the agenda. But there are rooms back here that are not that are not used 24-7. Now here's where the challenge comes for you. This is your challenge. I got schedules. I got things I got to do. I got a house I got to clean. I got things I got to, I got to fix this. I got to go that. I got to, and you got all these different things. Well, go ahead. And if that's where your heart's at, then keep on doing that. But you will not be a part of the thing that happens from the standpoint of being in the thick of it. You'll have to come in from the periphery. You'll either be one of the 22,000 or, or one of the 9,700, but you won't be the 300. And so this thing comes with the price. It comes with the price. It comes with the sacrifice. It comes with the focus. And if you can't do it because you're not willing to do it, that's between you and the Lord. Some may start slow, some may start fast, some may start intense and quit. God's looking for the long-distance runners, not the, sprint, not the short-distance sprinters. He's not looking for those who are going to come in, test, sample, and see, and then leave. He's looking for consistency. You can't be the, the fearful. That ain't going to work. You can't be the brazen and bold of the 10,000, you know, until the Lord separates the 9,700 from them. You're going to have to be those that are saying, I know this is real and God is going to do something. And you have to be willing to keep taking that sledgehammer and hitting it a thousand times and see nothing happen. And keep hitting it. And keep hitting it. And keep hitting it. Until finally it stresses and then it breaks. And when it breaks, the power of God's going to come. And that will be the difference. This is a challenge for me too. It's a challenge for me. And there will be times when it will be tiring. And there will be times when it will be dry. And there will be times when it will be repetitive. And there will be week, maybe two, maybe three, maybe five, maybe ten months. And you may see something and you may see nothing. But we know that God says, if you don't quit, I'll be found by you. And that becomes a difference. So we can't, we can't put religious exercise to this. It's not going to work. The, the one hour Sunday morning Christian isn't going to be the one that shows up with a sledgehammer. I can can't promise you that. Okay? The one day a week Christian that can only make Sunday morning most of the time isn't going to be the one that's going to show up with a sledgehammer. It's the ones that are hungering and thirsting and hungering and thirsting says there's a God in heaven and we're going to see His power come. That's what you're going to see. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't know where to begin on this, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Remember, God's taking us to a place we've never been. To give us something that we've never had. 
to require us something of us that we've never given. And I don't know, I can't lead the way on this one. Nobody can. Because the only way to get there is by the Holy Spirit. He's going to have to be the leader on this one for us. But that is, you all pray. And pray for the way of the Lord. And then we will set this thing as a starting point and adjust it as, as, as we go. Okay, and that will be on next Thursday we'll talk about this. Amen? Amen. Are you willing? Yes. I mean, if you believe that the Lord is there to be found and that we're, we are the generation that's chosen for this great move of God, if nothing else, where we're assigned right here in Cheyenne for a Brownsville to take place right here in Cheyenne, where the interstates cross and we are, on the, we are at the crosshairs of that, I believe God is going to do something. And I do believe with all my heart that God will answer this prayer and that He will not turn away a people who are seeking Him for, for a major explosion to take place. Amen. I see I-80 and I-25 trunkways coming up. And if there's anything that's going to have to be, God, where do we put the crowds? Where do we put them? This field will be full behind us. And then where do we go from there? It's got to go to the other churches. Let them come in, catch the fires of God, and go back and set the fire on, let the place on fire there again. And let Cheyenne be put on the map, not, not for any nobility of Cheyenne, but for the sake of the hearts of the people seeking God and for the glory of His name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.